Trump. We ready to go? Yes. Amen. Well, good morning in His Presence Church and everybody tuning in on Facebook and YouTube and iTube and WeTubes and all any tubes that you're on. Uh, I just want to welcome you this morning to church. Um, I believe that God has a great message for us this morning. I, we had a great time of worship. Um, but I truly believe that God has a message for his people. You know, I was doing my study uh, the other day. Hang on for one second. I was doing my study for the other day. And um, I got in the, the book of uh, uh, Mark. And there was a, a scripture in there where Jesus is coming back from just feeding the 4,000 people. If you read that, he was 4,000 people. They had two loaves of, or five loaves of bread, two loaves, uh, two fishies. And he fed 4,000 people, not including women and children. So you know that there was more than 4,000 people. And, and what a miracle that these disciples, they witnessed Jesus feeding the 4,000. And so they to have their quiet time and they're away from all the people. They're away from the hustle and bustle. And the disciples had been walking with Jesus now for three years. And Jesus asked them a question. Now, before we go into the, the scripture, I want to go into this verse, particularly in the book of John, chapter 21. John was one of the apostles, was one of the witnesses to Jesus. And in the book of John, chapter 21, in verse 24 and 25, the word of the Lord comes to us this morning and says, This disciple, John, is the one who testifies to these events and has recorded them here. And we know that his account of these things is accurate. John is an eyewitness to Jesus. Amen. He's telling us, I saw it, I'm testifying. In verse 25, it says, Jesus also did many other things. If they were all written down, I suppose the whole world could not contain the books that would be written. So what we see in the Gospels is only a portion of what Jesus did. Amen. Okay, we, have to, we have to understand that, that just a portion of what we read is all the miracles that Jesus did. So they get done, and they, they're sitting alone, and in the book of Mark, chapter 8, verse 27 through 30, it says, Jesus and his disciples left Galilee and went up to the villages near Caesarea Philippi. As they were walking along, he asked them, Who do people say I am? Well, they replied, they replied, Some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, others say you are one of the prophets. Then he asked them, and this is the question that God is asking us this morning. But who do you say I am? Amen. Amen. Who do you say I am? Peter replied, you are the Messiah. But Jesus warned them not to tell anybody about it. Who do you say I am? Amen. The title of this message this morning is very clear. Jesus is asking us a question. Who do you say I am? Amen. And who do you say I am? Leslie, who do you say I am? April, who do you say I am? Luke, who do you say I am? Amen. It's a question that, that, we, that everybody has to answer, but we all have to answer it depending on what we're going through, I guess. It's like, how big is your God? Yeah. You know, how big is your God if you get a cancer, uh, a cancer diagnosis of three to four weeks to live? And how big is your God if you found out you won a million dollars in the lottery? It's all relevant unto the experiences that we feel. But the disciples walked with Jesus. They were witnesses to Jesus. We don't have that luxury. But Jesus, how many of you know that Jesus is still doing miracles today? Amen. There are many miracles today. I, I shared the miracle of my mother and her cancer struggles. And I'm sure that each of us have an experience that we could talk about when we talk about Jesus and the miracles. Who do you say that I am? Jesus asked his disciples this question. It was recorded three times in the four Gospels. The question is more complicated than it might seem because the answer, their answer just wasn't, well, you're Jesus. It was so much more. And at some point in our lives, we are faced with that similar question. Who do, you, who do you say Jesus is? Is he a prophet? A moral teacher? A heretic, as some of them called him in the, in the New Testament? The Son of God? The Messiah? Who is Jesus? 
And the secondary question that we're going to answer this morning is, does America still need Jesus? Amen. See, and that's the first thing you, you ask believers. Does America need Jesus, Justin? And they're going to say, oh, yeah, we need Jesus. But then you look at the state of affairs that's happening in America today. We have abortion on demand where you could kill an unborn baby, and now you could kill a born baby if you do it immediately after they're being born. Yeah. Yeah. Does America need Jesus? Yes. We see the state of marriage that once was between a man and a woman totally disregarded yeah. because of an agenda of 1% of the population. You see God being taken out of schools, of government buildings. They want to take it off our money. And the other day I saw this Antifa member saying they wanted to tear down the statue of the white Jesus. Does America need Jesus? Yeah. See, that's the answer. Yeah. But if that is the answer for every believer, why are we in the state that we're in? I did a study. It shows that 2016, 70% of adults identified as Christians. 260 million, something like that. If 260 million people identified as Christians, 70% of adults, why are we in such dire straits? Why do we have the politicians that we have? Why do we have the laws that we have? And I'm telling you, it's because believers have turned their back on Jesus. Amen. They have turned their back on the Word of God. And they're following their own selfish ambitions. They're all following the crowd. They're voting a party instead of a relationship with their Lord and Savior, Jesus. Yes, America does need Jesus. But it's up to the remnant. It's up to the remnant. Hello? The remnant to call down the powers. The power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. To speak. Who do you say I am? Who is Jesus? Jesus is. God is. The great I am. Amen. He is the great I am. He is the beginning and the end, the first and the last, the alpha and the omega, the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He is, he was, and he ever shall be. Amen. We as a church, we need to start believing that. We need to start living that. See, so many of us say, oh yeah, America needs Jesus, but then we vote. And then, oh yeah, America needs Jesus, but we sit idly by as a small percentage of the population turns Jesus out. Yeah, we need Jesus, but we have allowed the minority to suppress the majority. Amen. And, and all they have to say is, well, didn't Jesus say turn the other cheek a little? Didn't, didn't Jesus say turn the other cheek, Debbie? Yeah, but Jesus went to the temple and kicked some butt, didn't he? Yeah. When they found out they were they were desecrating the Father's house. So my house, my Father's house, is a house of prayer. Amen. You turn it into a dentist. What did he do? He didn't turn the other cheek. He whooped some... He, he turned over the tables. Yeah. Amen. He created havoc. The church, right now, is sitting idly by while... All our freedoms are being taken from us. Yeah. yeah. And we're doing it. You know, it's like the thief coming into your house when you're home and you open up the door and show them where all the jewelry is. <laughs> you know, I, I heard a pastor say, if, the, if, if this were the days of Nebuchadnezzar and he built that statue and he told everybody to bow down, half the pastors in the United States of America would say, yeah, go ahead and bow down. They would not stand up like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and stand up for their rights. They would bow down. Yeah. Does America need Jesus more than ever? Amen. But it doesn't start in all America. It starts with us. It starts with you. Yeah. 
with your example, are you the exa are you the shining light to the rest of the world? Do do you walk the walk? Do you talk the talk? Or are you just like 90% of Christians just sort of go along with it? Well, I don't want to create this. Oh, I don't want to create havoc. I don't want to disturb you. I don't want to bother anybody with my faith. We, this, I believe tomorrow, they're going to start confirming a Supreme Court judge. Yeah. Now, by all rights, this lady is probably overqualified to be a member of the Supreme Court. Amen. But there's two things that are not in her favor. Number one, her political affiliation. And number two, her religious affiliation. Yeah. Yeah. Say See, if she was the other political affiliation, that religious affiliation wouldn't matter. And, and it's going to be a train wreck. It's going to be a train wreck. God's people, we, we need to start praying. Yeah. Amen. Pastor Maria hit the nail right in the head. We need to pray, but pray without ceasing. Constantly be in prayer. Yeah. You know, it's like, well, I'm going to pray, but Oprah's on. So when Oprah's done, and after the football game, then I'll pray. You know, I, I swore that I wasn't going to watch any football this year. I don't agree with what I see. I haven't watched any NBA. I haven't watched anything. But last Sunday night, I was sitting and watching, turn the TV on, happened to be on channel two and I look and there was a football game on and there was a team in red that had a big SF on their helmet <laughs> and I said I'm not going to watch this two and a half hours later <laughs> I turned it off because they lost but anyway besides that you know we have we have we have allowed the minority to take over the majority yeah. when did that happen how, how did we allow that to happen yeah, how did the church one time, the pillar of the community. Do you know at one time, when there was a problem in the community, they went to the church? They went to the priest? They went to the pastor? The pastor was one of the most influential people in the community. Yeah. If there was an issue in the community, they went to the pastor. Now, they discount the pastor. Yeah. I saw a, a clip from one of these programs that comes on. What, what's that program where they got a bunch of crazy people on Ladies, the view. Oh, yeah. They they take them out of the mental institution. They put them out there for an hour. <laughs> and they were talking about um, Vice President Trump, uh, Vice Pence. President Pence. And Pence was talking about how he prays and he prays out loud to his God. Yeah. And one of those those nuts, she must have slipped out of her her jacket, and she said, "Oh, what kind of mental condition is that where you pray to an invisible person?" That's a mental condition. Oh, wow. See, they're discounting your faith. See, it's not that your faith is in God. It's that it's a mental condition. Who are these people to judge my faith? America needs God. Amen. But who is God? Who is Jesus to you? The book of Exodus, chapter 3, and verses 13 through 14 says, but Moses protested, if I go to the people of Israel and tell them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, they will ask me, what is his name? Then what should I tell them? God replied to Moses, I am who I am. Amen. Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me. I am. What does that mean, I am? What do you want it to mean, Colby? Sue, what do you want it to mean? I am your needs. I am your savior. I am your healer. I am your strong tower. I am, I am, I am. What do you need? You just have to call on that name. What does the Bible say? When you call on the name of Jesus, what happens? The devil flees. That's right. See, we're so afraid of the devil and all the power that we have. And, 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 and we're just, oh, the devil this, the devil that. Jesus, the devil's gone. That's right. The devil is gone. Don't you wish it was that easy to get rid of like older children living in your basement? <laughs> uh, you know, relatives that stay for come and visit for the weekend and they're there for like Christmas and it's 
They came in like New Year's. Jesus! And then they're gone. No more neighbors. No more now. Jesus. The enemy will flee. There's power in the name of Jesus. There's power in the blood. Amen. Amen. Who is Jesus to you? Is he your I am? In the book, in the New Testament, Jesus tells us who he is. We, we, we think, you know, and the disciples walked with him for three years and they couldn't figure it out until finally Peter said, you are the Messiah. But Jesus, throughout his walk, tells us, in, in John 6, 35, he said, I am the bread of life. Amen. In John 14, 6, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. In John 8, 12, he says, I am the light of the world. I am the good shepherd, he tells us in John 10, 11. I am the resurrection and the life Amen. in John eleven twenty five. 25. I am the true vine. I am the door of the sheep. What is he trying to tell us, church? He's everything. He's I am. Yeah, yeah. As God told Moses, tell them I am sent me. God is telling you the same thing. I am. Jesus, I am. The Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they recount this thing when Jesus goes to be baptized by John the Baptist. In Matthew 3, 17, we read, And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. This is my Son. Jesus is the Son of God. That's right. I am. Mark 9, 11, Then a cloud appeared and covered them, and a voice came from the cloud, This is my Son, whom I love. Listen to him. Jesus is, I am. And in Luke 9, 35, a voice came from the cloud saying, This is my son whom I have chosen. Listen to him. You say, have this pastor friend of mine, he'd be preaching, he'd be preaching his heart out, and he'd be going, listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. That, doesn't that sound like parents, like a mom? Mm -hmm. Listen to me. Listen to me. Sounds like grandpa every day dealing with those kids. Listen to me. In John 3, 16 and 17, the word of the Lord comes to us this morning and says, For God so loved the world. Amen. We could stop right there. That's right. Doesn't say God loved Christians. Doesn't say God loved in his present church members. Doesn't say God loved. It says God loved the world. Amen. That means everybody is his. And his thing is that none should perish. Nobody. Ne'er a soul, as they say. Nobody. That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Amen. Streets paved with gold. No more tears. No more sorrow. Mm -hmm. No more hate. No more anger. I'm with Pastor Marie. I don't even want to turn on the TV anymore. You turn on the TV, and what do you get? Hate, lies. When you go into the book of Psalms, there's a, there's a scripture that said there are six things that God hates. Seven that are detestable to him. And two of the things I just mentioned, lying and hate, are two of the things that God hates. And that's all you see on TV. You know, and, and I just saw this thing. How much do you hate Trump? That the other side is is sounds like a good idea to you. Seriously, I'm talking to Christians. I'm talking to believers. How much do you hate the president of the United States? That the Democratic Party, who supports abortion, who supports gay marriage, who supports everything that goes against the Word of God, is a better solution to you than what we have now. How does how does a believer have that much hate in him? The Bible tells us that God is love. That we are supposed to be Christ-like. We're supposed to be like God. So we should have all this love in us. How do we go from that to that much hate? I'm talking about believers. We're not talking about secular. We're not talking about non-believers that hate the President of the United States. We're talking about Christian believers who identify as Christian believers and call themselves Christians. 
How do you do that? Doesn't it tell us that before you give your tithes, your offerings, or whatever, when you go to the altar, if you have anything against your brother, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to leave it at the altar and go make amends with him. But yet, it seems like every day there's more and more hate, more and more people deceiving, trying to deceive us. This world is going to hell in a handbasket, as my mom used to say. I don't know what that means, but... Now, we have to understand that we are just in the world. We are part of it, but we are not of the world. That's right. But because we are in the world, we still have to live in the world, and we just can't bury our head in the sand like Limu the Emu. We have to be awake. We have to stand up for what's ours. You know, I saw this video, and, and I was like appalled. I was in law enforcement for like 30 years, and, and I have my own attitudes, and I have my own uh, prejudice, and I have my own this and that. But they showed a party of Hispanics that were having a birthday party for their daughter. And this group of Antifa people came in and disrupted the party, started turning over the tables, and started throwing the punch all over the place. And they walked into somebody's backyard, yeah. and they started doing all this stuff. And I'm thinking, how come nobody got punched in the face? Oh, yeah. How do you allow somebody to come inside your house, come on your property, and just do all this stuff, and you just sit there idly by and do nothing? Well, I'm turning the other cheek, Pastor. Yeah, turn the other cheek when you start whooping. You know, we got we to gotta get ready here. You know, the Bible says it, that it comes by force. It comes by force. And sometimes, you know, mighty men of valor, mighty women of valor, Mighty soldiers, you have to be ready for battle. Yeah. Tell us in the last days at Armageddon, there's going to be a war. Yeah. And how prepared are you? When, when the Israelites left Egypt, God took them around the easiest way to get there because they weren't prepared for war. Mm. Are you prepared for war? Or are we just going to cower back and allow somebody to just tear up your, your kid's birthday party? Because we, we want to be woke. Mm. We want to be woke. You know, I do not follow wokeness. I follow the Word of God. Because the Word of God tells me it's truth. Yeah. And that truth will set me free. Who is Jesus to you? Is he or I am? In the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verse 19, the word of the Lord comes and says, So now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens along with all of God's holy people. You are members of God's family. Amen. Amen. You have a family. God's family. You're God's people. Amen. You belong to God. Amen. So the authority that, that we have is in God, not in man. You know, we follow the rules of man because we're here and God gave us the authority. But what happens when man's authority supersedes God's authority? We're in bondage. What do you do? Do you bow down and worship the statue of Nebuchadnezzar? Do you bow down and worship the, the statue of Mr. Cuomo? Nancy Pelosi? Donald Trump? Or do we stand like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and say, my God has the power, the ability, and the authority to save me from this situation. But even if he doesn't, I will never bow down and worship. In California, the governor of California shut down all the churches. Again? This is before. And the churches, they all bowed down. They all stopped for six weeks because they were told they, that they had to break some COVID cycle. That's why they shut down. After six weeks turned into eight weeks, turned into 12 weeks, turned into... And, and they still, the COVID cycle was going down, but the churches still couldn't. The, the marijuana stores were open. The strip clubs were open. The liquor stores were open. But no church. 
Finally, they got into the last phase four. You can get your hair did, get your nails painted. You can get a cheeseburger, but you couldn't go to church. After four or five months, the church has finally said, enough. And they, they wrote a letter to the governor. They told him, you know, we respect your authority, but we are not going to follow this. This is not fair. Amen. They began to have churches inside. They were threatened like we are now here. They continue to have church. And more and more churches continued to violate that order from the, from the governor that was deemed unconstitutional in court. Amen. 30,000 churches. And then miraculously, the governor said, oh, churches could open. The power of the people. Amen. You know your vote, your vote counts? Yes, it does. Your vote matters? Yeah. No, seriously, your vote matters. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a lot of people here in New York go, well, it doesn't matter if I vote because New York City. Yeah. My vote doesn't count because New York City. Yeah. Your vote counts. Your vote matters. Philippians 127. Above all, you live, you must live as citizens of heaven. I'll read that again. Somebody needs to hear this. Philippians 127. Above all, you must live as citizens of heaven, conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the good news about Christ. And whether I come and see you again or only hear about you, I will know that you are standing together with one spirit, one purpose, fighting together for the faith. Amen. Standing together in one spirit for one purpose, for the faith. Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? What do you need in your life? I saw this interesting thing. I'm going to sort of pop this thing up in my study. I saw it last night, ironically. We talked about who's Jesus and um, the disciples saying, you're the Messiah. In the book of John, chapter 7, I'm going to read the whole, the whole thing to you. John 7, starting in 1. After this, Jesus went around in Galilee. He did not want to go about Judah because the Jewish leaders were looking for a way to kill him. But when the Jewish festival of tabernacles was near, Jesus' brothers said to him, these are his brothers, Mary's kids, leave Galilee and go to Judea so that your disciples there may see the works you do. No one who wants to become a public figure acts in secret. Since you are doing these things, show yourself to the world. They're, they're teasing him. They're ragging on him. And then in verse 5 it says, For even his own brothers did not believe in him. Mm. Even Jesus' brothers didn't believe in him. They were making fun of him. Oh, are we doing this in public? You shouldn't be doing this in private. You should be doing it in public. You want to be a hero? Go. Even his brothers didn't believe in him. In Jude 17, 21, But you, my dear friends, must remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ predicted. They told you that in the last times there would be scoffers whose purpose in life is to satisfy their ungodly desires. These people are the ones who are creating division among you, they follow their natural instincts because they do not have God's spirit in them. They follow their own natural desires. But you, Christians, but you believers, it says in 20, must build each other up in your most holy faith and pray and pray and pray in the power of the Holy Spirit. And await the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will bring you eternal life. In this way, you will keep yourself safe in God's love. Does America need Jesus? Yes. 
It seems there are more Americans today that, that do not want Jesus, that do not want Jesus to have anything to do with this country. America is split more now than ever before. How is this possible when approximately 70.6 of adults in the United States are identifying themselves as Christian? Why is hate and anger overtaking our country so much? Could be because much of the country has stopped following Jesus. But we have to remember that Jesus died for them too. If they believe in him or not. So it is more at this time, at this moment, we need to stand up and say, no more. Amen. No more. No mas. No mas. No more. Decide to follow Jesus and change your life forever. Church, I can't get over the fact how much we need Jesus in our life. There should not be a day that goes by that we're not praying cease, without ceasing. There should not be a day that goes by that we don't praise and worship God. There should not be a day, especially in these days. That we, there's so many things to be praying for. Well, I don't have anything to pray for, Pastor. Seriously? How about your neighborhoods? How about your city? How about your state? How about your country? How about the world? That we don't have anything to pray for is, is, is a ridiculous statement. There's just so much to pray for and not enough time. Amen. Not enough time. Romans 10, 8 through 11. But what does it say? The world is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the message concerning the faith that we proclaim. It's in your mouth. It's in your heart. Now it says that's the message that we proclaim. Are you proclaiming the message of Jesus Christ? Are you? If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It's that simple. It's that simple. To all those people that have turned away from God, it's not too late to come back. But one day, one day soon, it will be. The Bible says that one day you'll look up in the sky and Jesus will be coming from the east. And the armies will be gathering and there'll be Armageddon. Then it is too late. It is too late. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. It is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. Anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. Church, I can't, I can't say this enough. I can't say it. No, we need Jesus. Yeah. Plain and simple. Just not amen. Does America need Jesus? Amen. We'll do something about it then. How does, G how does America need Jesus? In every way. But Christians just sort of sit by and hope that somebody, that their neighbor will go ahead and get, the, get Jesus to the rest of the world. You know, we have a vice president that stood up on national TV and said that he was against abortion. He didn't apologize for it. Amen. Amen. Trump has gone up and talked about how he's against abortion. What, the, what a bully pul pulpit we have. And what happens when they proclaim that? They're mocked. They're mocked. By who? Media. The people with power, the media. And it goes out there, and then all of a sudden you have other people saying, well, that's, they're, they're crazy. Believers. Believers. I saw the other day 300, 300, 200, 200 evangelical pastors put their uh, vote in for Biden. Wow. 200 evangelical pastors. Because they said that Trump was crazy. He was a madman. He was a liar. Wow. Where do you hear all that stuff? The press. In 1988, the NAACP gave Trump an award. Yeah. They gave him an award for all the great things he did for the African American community and, and the people of the whole. They gave him an award. There was Jesse Jackson. There was all these people. In 1988, he was the man. In 2016, they hated him. Why? Because he ran against, you know who? Hillary Villary. Now he's the enemy. 
One of the things that I have noticed over the, the, my lifespan is how evil politicians have become. Yeah. You see, before politicians used to run, they used to run on a platform. This is what they believe. This is what they believe. You as a people, you listen to what they said, and you voted according to your principles if your beliefs were with their beliefs. Somewhere along the line, in the 80s, it became fashionable to attack your opponent, to demonize your opponent, and to make your opponent worse than the devil. So that if your opponent was running against the devil, you would vote for the devil. To demonize you. Where does that come from? That comes from the pit of hell. And, and what's ironic is people fall for that and they believe it. You know, if you repeat a lie so much, you begin to believe it's true. Yeah. If you repeat a lie, you will believe it's true. Yeah. But the Bible says what's, re what's done in darkness. Yeah. And we're going to pray that this November the light comes to this world. That the light comes to America. It's ironic that you see... On the news, once again, all these polls. I saw a poll that Biden was ahead of Trump by 20%. Don't believe him. 20%. And yet, the, the, the Democrats are still trying to kick him out of office. Yeah, why? If they're so sure that he's going to lose in November, just leave him alone. Mm -hmm. You only got 30 more days. And let the, let the voters vote. That's because those... Anybody here ever been called for a poll? You? What's the best lasagna? A political poll for who you? Okay, one person out of how many we have here? I've never been called, I've never been asked. But you see, you know, Biden is ahead of Trump by 20 points. And you see, based on a thousand people, a thousand people, how many, how many, how many Americans are, you know, I just still told you 260, uh, million people confess to be Christians. How many people do we have in this country? And they do a thousand and they come up with that. They try to tell us that, that one guy's going to win by 20. Right. And people are going, oh, well, you know. Why do they do that? Fear. Yeah. To discourage you. If you're a Trump supporter and you see he's down by 20, what does that do? Well, he lost. Because we're, we're, we're a pessimistic people. <laughs> We need to get excited about Amen. who we are. And I, I'm not just talking about a candidate, Trump or, or Biden. I'm talking about get excited for God. God's Amen. righteousness. You know, when you vote, vote, vote the principles in the Bible. Amen. It doesn't matter if they're Republican, they're Democrat, they're communist, they're socialist, they're, they live in Dunkirk or Niagara Falls. Whatever they, you vote what the Bible says. It's the word of God. You can't go wrong with that. If 70% of the population were Christ of Christians voted that way, we would have a completely different country than we have now. Amen. Completely different. Now, who... <laughs> <laughs> who let the dogs out? <laughs> who let the dogs out? Somebody let the dogs out. Jeremiah 29, 11. We're going to go ahead and close with this. Because I know some of you want to get home and get ready to watch the Bills game on Tuesday. <laughs> Jeremiah 29, 11 and 12. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Somebody needs to listen. God knows the plans he has for you. Amen. Melina, God knows the plans he has for you. Plans to prosper you, Pastor Maria, not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future, Justin. A hope and a future. God did not intend for us to be moping around, wondering where, what's going to happen here, what's going to happen there. God has a future and a plan for you. And that's to be mauled by a dog in church. Don't baptize him. <laughs>
Don't baptize him. I had a dog that every time you pet him, he gets sad like that. Pissed. He'd go to the bathroom all over the place. <laughs> Don't baptize our pastor. <laughs> then you will call on me, it tells us in 12, and pray to me, and this is God's promise, I will listen to you. Amen. I will listen to you. I will, how many of us want God to say, you know what, I'll, I'm listening. I'm listening. As we, as we begin to pray, I'm listening. Karen, I'm listening. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. No one. So how bad do we need Jesus? We need Jesus to get to the Father. Without Jesus, we don't come to the Father. Amen? Amen. 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 What about you? Who do you say that Jesus is? The core principle, I found this and I thought it was pretty cool. The core principle that sets Christianity apart from every other religion is our belief that the supreme God of the universe took on human flesh, lived among us, and then in his immense love died that we might be forgiven. Amen. No other religion has their God doing that, dying for you. If we are willing to claim Jesus as Lord and to submit ourselves to him, we are invited to live with him forever. This is something no prophet, no teacher, no revolutionary can offer. Are you willing to accept the great power and the love of Jesus Christ, the Son of God? If you are, say amen. 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 When we point this question at ourselves, it creates an equal, a great opportunity to see where we stand in our faith and religion and relationship towards Christ. So who do you say that Jesus is? Father, right now, would you bow your heads? We thank you, Lord, for this word. We pray, Lord, that it'll touch, uh, touch hearts, it'll touch lives. we we'll begin to work in your people, that they may begin to understand who you are in their life. Mm -hmm. Who do the people say that you are, Jesus? You are our king our strong tower, our savior, the great communicator, our attorney. Father, you are whatever we need in whatever situation and circumstance we find ourselves in at the time. You will never leave us, your word says. You will never forsake us. You will always be there for us. Sometimes in your silence, Lord, you are still there. We will always praise you. We will always worship you for you have always blessed us. But even if, even if, Lord, you shut up the heavens and even if, Lord, you don't hear from us, we will continue to praise you. We will continue to worship you. We will continue to honor your great name. So when I think of who you are to me, Father God, you are my everything. Amen. You are my everything. The great I am. Maker of heaven and earth. My creator. My strong tower. Lord bless me this day. Bless us this day. Protect us this day Father God. We pray for our pastor here and her family. Lord we pray for the school. Lord we pray for the church. Lord that you put your hand upon it. And let no man. No man. Take it away. Amen. Amen. Father, we just thank you that you are a great God, an awesome God, and a mighty God. Yes. That we love you, we worship you, we praise you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Pastor John. You're welcome. And thank you, Jesus. <laughs>